Henry VIII and his chopping block. Henry VIII. Everybody's heard of him. Ask anyone why Henry is horribly famous and they'll probably say... He was bigger than a double-decker bus. He got married six times. He chopped off more heads than a chicken farmer. <laughs> That's the trouble with being horribly famous. People think they know all about you. But the truth is sometimes a lot more interesting. For instance, did you know that Henry was horribly famous for being a handsome hunk and king of fashion? One of his wives was thought to be a witch. Or that he chopped off the heads of only the noblest of his victims. Henry's is a nasty tale full of battles, blood, betrayal and beheadings. But it didn't start out that way. Chapter 1. Growing Henry. Henry was born on the 28th of June, 1491, to a family called the Tudors. They were a pretty weird bunch. Come and meet the family. Catherine of France. Great-grandma Catherine married King Henry V. Without her, the Tudors' dodgy claim to the throne wouldn't have existed. When her first hubby died, Catherine was left a lonely 21-year-old widow. Then she fell in love with her wardrobe clerk and gave him her hand in marriage. The wardrobe clerk was none other than Henry's great-granddad, Owen Tudor. Great-granddad Owen was a nobody before his marriage. Low-born servants weren't supposed to go around proposing to queens of England. The marriage caused a big scandal, but Owen and Catherine went on to have four children. One of them, Edmund Tudor, was Henry VIII's granddad. Catherine already had a son from her first marriage to Henry V, and he became... King Henry VI. He was only eight months old when he came to the throne. Even when he grew up, he made a hopeless king. At one point, poor old Henry went completely bonkers. His wife gave birth to a son, Edward, but Henry didn't know anything about little Eddie until he recovered months later. Because Henry was such a washout, the powerful nobles saw their chance to get their dirty hands on England's crown. That started a violent quarrel known as the Wars of the Roses. Henry VII. Henry VIII's dad was clever and ambitious. He wanted the crown of England for the Tudors. Never mind that there were at least ten people in England who had a better claim to the throne than he did. Henry grabbed the crown, then spent the rest of his life worrying that he might lose it again. The Wars of the Roses. Might sound like a gardening contest, but actually it was one of the bloodiest wars in English history. The two most powerful families in England, the Yorks and the Lancasters, fought each other for the crown of England. Now, most fights are over quickly, but this one went on for 30 years. Before it ended, three kings had come to nasty ends. But Henry VII had snatched up the crown for himself and for the Tudor family. In 1486, Henry's first son, Arthur, was born, and Henry ordered great celebrations throughout the land. Arthur was expected to become the next Tudor king of England. He was the apple of his daddy's eye. When little Henry came along, five years later, no one made a big fuss. He was only on the reserve list. While Henry Jr. was growing up, his family in constant danger, Henry VII could never sit comfortably on the throne. The Yorkists, still fuming at losing the Wars of the Roses, weren't giving up easily. But against this background of plots and threats, little Henry was growing in importance. By the age of two, he'd started on his collection. Now, most children collect stamps or football stickers, Henry preferred to collect titles. The more titles you had, the more of a big noise you were. And as big noises go, Henry was very loud indeed. By the tender age of 13, he has been made Constable of Dover Castle, Knight of the Bath, Duke of York, Knight of the Garter and Prince of Wales. The Swatty Prince. In Tudor times, most boys of Henry's age couldn't read or write their own name. Girls didn't go to school at all. But Henry was a prince, so his education was in another class. In fact, he was in a class all by himself. 
Uh, hands up, who can name the kings and queens of England? Oh, me! 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 Henry's teacher was a priest called John Skelton. He was also the most famous poet of his day. Like Henry, he was bold, boisterous and loud. He made a big impression on young Henry, and Skelton was impressed by his pupil. Henry is a boy, noble in the nobility of his father, and furthermore, a brilliant pupil. A step up for Henry. In 1502, something happened which changed Henry's life forever. Arthur died. Henry's big brother, you remember, was next in line for the throne. It was bad news for his bride, Catherine of Aragon. The couple was still on their honeymoon at the time. One week he was dancing with Catherine. The next, he was dead as a flat-footed dodo. Arthur's death meant two things for Henry. First, and most importantly, he would be the next king. Second, Arthur's bride, Catherine of Aragon, was short of a husband. Only a few weeks after Arthur died, the Spanish king, Catherine's father, was making plans to marry Catherine off to Henry. Henry was only ten years old at the time. Catherine was an older woman of sixteen. What's more, she couldn't speak a word of English, while Henry didn't know any Spanish. The only thing the two had in common was Arthur, and he'd been very quiet since his death. But royal marriages were usually decided by politics, not love. England and Spain were two powerful countries, and they both hated France. What better reason for the next king of England to marry a Spanish princess? They just had to wait for Henry to grow up. Seven years later, in 1509, Henry VII breathed his last. Suddenly, the wedding plans were in full swing. Catherine and Henry were married two weeks before Henry, Prince of Wales, was crowned King Henry VIII of England. The new king was just 17 years old. Henry was charming, sporty and a handsome hunk. He could play the lute, write pretty ditties, hunt, win a joust, dance till dawn and turn the head of any woman at court. England was overjoyed to see the young prince on the throne. His subjects loved him. Getting down to work. Once Henry became king, he had no intention of changing his ways. He left most of the politics to his ministers while he got on with more important things, like having fun. Funnily enough, this made Henry more popular. People liked to see a king who lived it up and ate like a hungry hog. And the king wasn't to blame if the taxes were too heavy. He was out hunting. Henry's secret diary. 8 a.m. <sighs> Dragged myself out of bed after another late night. My pals arrived for my dressing ceremony. <laughs> Many goodly jokes about how much we drank and lost at cards last night. 9 a.m. Went to chapel. The Archbishop says good Christian kings are meant to attend Mass five times a day. I've told the old goat I can only manage three. 9.30 a.m. Saddled up. Got through eight horses today while out hunting. I swear I'd happily hunt all day if it wasn't for my other love calling me home. No, not Catherine. Supper! 6 p.m. By St Mary, I was hungry. Ate an enormous meal of seven courses. 7pm. Spent a tiresome hour listening to my secretary read reports from other kingdoms. Then had to copy the letters my secretary has prepared for me. By my oath, I'd rather wrestle the King of Spain than write him a letter. 8pm. I amazed everyone by dancing and leaping all evening. And this, after a day of hunting. 9pm. Gambled with my pals late into the night. Twelve midnight. Crawl into bed. Another hard day over. So did Henry let the country go to the dogs while he lived it up? Actually, no. Although he only spent an hour a day on state affairs, Henry was still the head man. The sporty king. But as we know, Henry much preferred playing to politics. And hunting wasn't Henry's only sporting passion. He found time for lots of others. Henry's sporting album. Hawking. 
When the weather was too wet or frosty for hunting, Henry went hawking. Hawks, peregrines and eagles were hunters, like Henry himself. He fussed over them as if they were his own children. Archery. Most Tudor men couldn't hit a barn door with an arrow. Guns had just been invented, and people thought the longbow was yesterday's news. Henry disagreed. He could hit the bullseye from 200 metres. Riding. Henry could handle a horse with the best. From an early age, he learnt to mount and dismount without putting his foot in a stirrup. The tricky bit was doing it in full armour. Gambling. Henry loved to bet. He would wager money on anything, a wrestling match, a joust or a game of tennis. The king lost the equivalent of thousands of pounds a day. If you wanted to be in Henry's gang, you needed a big purse. Jousting. Jousting ranked with hunting as Henry's favourite sport. In one bout, Henry and his cousin, the Duke of Suffolk, broke eight lances each. <laughs> Good old Henry? There was no doubt Henry was popular early in his reign. He dressed gorgeously and lived life to the full. But Henry had a dark side. Chapter 2. Holy Henry. By 1527, Henry was beginning to realise he had a big problem. It's known in history as the King's Great Matter. Being married to Catherine wasn't so great, and it mattered a lot to Henry. Henry's secret diary. By my oath, a pretty mess I'm in. Here I am, king of all England, without a royal son to fill my boots after I'm gone. There's my daughter Mary, but who ever heard of a queen of England? Is this curtains for the great name of Tudor? By the devil's fork, not while I still draw breath. It's obvious Kath is now past having children, and now I'm wild about that dainty morsel, Anne Boleyn. There's only one thing for it. Ditch ugly old Kath and marry pretty young Annie. I owe it to my country. Annie will bear me a bouncing boy, and England will have an heir to the throne. But here's the snag. For a divorce... I must go cap in hand to that old goat, the Pope. Better get my top man, crafty Cardinal Wolsey, to work on it. If anyone can pull the divorce off, he can. Pope problems. Henry's divorce was going to be no pushover. England was a Catholic country and Catholics weren't supposed to get divorced. The only person who could grant permission was the Pope. But Pope Clement VII found himself playing piggy in the middle between Henry and Emperor Charles V. The Emperor had conquered Rome and had Clement at his mercy. And it just so happened that Emperor Charlie's aunt was dead against the divorce. Well, she was Catherine of Aragon, so she would be, wouldn't she? If the Pope refused the divorce, he angered Henry. If he didn't, he enraged the Emperor. Pope Clement couldn't win. So he made up his mind his best policy was not to make up his mind. Big Head Wolsey. For 14 years, Thomas Wolsey was second only to Henry as the most powerful man in England. He was also the most hated man in England. As a cardinal, one down from being Pope, Wolsey should have been godly and humble. Instead, he was a big head and a show-off. Wolsey got so powerful... He imagined he was royalty. He boasted about his riches and dressed in furs and red silk robes. In the end, Henry's divorce was Wolsey's downfall. Wolsey thought he could use his influence with the Pope to get what Henry wanted. But the task proved beyond even the great big head. Henry had the cardinal arrested. But Wolsey died in 1530 before his head ever reached the block. The Long Divorce After six years of the dithers over the divorce, Henry got fed up with waiting. He married Anne Boleyn in secret. But Henry still needed the divorce. 
Since the Pope wouldn't do what Henry wanted, Henry looked around for a churchman who would. Enter Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer was made Archbishop of Canterbury so he could be Henry's yes-man. Cranmer granted the divorce, and Henry started his own church. And guess who was head of it? None other than little old me, King Henry, of course. But the divorce wasn't just bad news for Catherine. Once Wolsey got the boot, Henry asked Thomas More to be his Lord Chancellor. More was a clever thinker and writer, and one of Henry's closest friends. But he was also an honest man and loyal to the Pope. He didn't support Henry's divorce or the split with Rome. His head was soon on the chopping block. How to die nicely. Henry sent many nobles for the chop. He thought nothing of beheading his best friend, his best minister, even his own wives. So the axe man was kept in regular work. And if anyone could advise you how to die nicely, it was Henry's chopper-in-chief. Tips from the Chopping Block by B. Head. One. There are worse things than having your head chopped off, you know. It's a noble's death, so try not to tremble on the scaffold and don't dribble down your doublet. The crowd want to see you die like a gentleman. Two, don't forget to say your prayers to the good Lord above. After all, you'll be meeting him in a minute or two if you don't go to the other place. Three, it's the done thing to make a speech, but for pity's sake, keep it short. First, admit you're guilty and the king is doing you a favour, putting an end to your miserable life. Then urge the people to be loyal subjects and round off by praising the king again. He's probably not the top of your Christmas list right now, but you wouldn't like your family to end up like you. Four, I'm the last person you'll see. If I do a good job, it'll all be over nice and quick. If I'm a bit rusty, or me axe is, then it can be messy. Sometimes we have to get the saw out to finish the job, so it's a good idea to have your tip ready when you meet me. Five. For heaven's sake, keep your head still on the block. I don't want to go cutting off my own finger. Now, that would be a tragedy, eh? Dead ends and dastardly punishments. Death on the chopping block wasn't the only sentence Henry could hand out. Worse things were reserved for commoners and rebels. Hang him! Thieves and murderers were usually hanged to teach them a lesson. Go on, hang, draw and quarter him. The punishment for treason was especially nasty. The victim would be hanged by the neck, then cut down before they were actually dead. A man then had his most <coughs> private parts cut off and his bowels removed and burned before his eyes. Then the head was cut off, the body sliced in quarters, and all the bloody body bits were fixed on a pole on London Bridge for everyone to see. Burn the heretic! A heretic was anyone who disagreed with the religious beliefs of the day. A public burning was a popular event. Villagers came from miles around and brought their packed lunches with them. Heartless Henry. One noble who escaped the chopping block but still came to a sinister end was Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. The Tudor Tatler, January the 9th, 1536. Queen in poison death drama. Catherine of Aragon died yesterday amid sensational rumours that she was poisoned by the king, writes rogue reporter Ralph Quill. A Spanish doctor claimed, The king, he is a treacherous dog. But if Henry wants someone dead, he doesn't bother to do it in secret. To the murder charge, the tattler says, Not likely, El Doctor. To the charge that Henry broke his wife's heart, we say, Guilty, the rat. The People's Queen. Catherine may not have been a great beauty, but we English loved her because she was clever, talented and fearless. When Henry was off fighting in France, courageous Cath took over as Captain General of the Army and won. She was a hit with Henry. Has the King forgotten the days when he was mad about his first wife? She tried to give Henry a son. She gave birth six times. 
Wasn't her fault only Mary lived. The divorce was a fix. When Henry got the hots for sizzling Anne Boleyn, he suddenly decided it was wrong to have married his brother's wife 20 years after the wedding. The Tatler says Cathy was a good queen and a good wife. Let's hope Anne Boleyn doesn't live to regret being second choice. Chapter 3. Henry the Hero. All Henry's tournaments and archery contests were really just rehearsals. He was practising for the real thing, war. In Henry's day, a king who never went to war was a bit of a softy. So for Henry, war was a chance to cover himself in glory. Henry did win a few famous victories, but mainly his wars just fizzled out. He never achieved his aim of ruling Scotland and France. Meanwhile, he cost the country a fortune. The big fight. Henry's big rival was another king, keen to make a name for himself, Francis I of France. The two young rulers both wanted to be number one in Europe. Henry had his eye on the French throne. Francis aimed to restore the lands France had lost. Henry didn't trust Francis, and with good reason. In 1519, a spy sent back a disturbing report. Top secret, for the king's eyes only. Your great and most noble majesty, Francis, an English traitor, Richard de la Pole planned to send four assassins to the English court. There, by crafty means, they are to set fire to the palace where your grace is sleeping. Their object is to murder you in your bed and anyone else in the palace at the time. For this act of treachery, Pole promised the villains a reward of 4,000 francs. Be on your guard, my lord, and do not trust that cunning fox, Francis. Your faithful and true spy. This scroll will self-destruct in ten seconds. Battle of the Boasters Henry and Francis were spoiling for a fight, but they didn't go to war at first. Instead, they arranged a meeting that became a Battle of the Boasters. It was known as the Field of the Cloth of Gold. The meeting was to celebrate peace at last, between long-term enemies England and France. But in truth, Henry wanted to prove he was Europe's number one and Francis planned to show Henry a thing or two about French style. The chosen place was Golden Valley in France, the year 1520. The valley began to look like a land of fairy castles. People called it the eighth wonder of the world but it was more like the biggest games show in history. So, who won the Battle of the Shores? Henry or Francis? Welcome to the Field of the Cloth of Gold, where the world's greatest boasters are about to battle it out. Henry, can you kick off with first boast? My palace. It's a work of art. In the Italian style, it took 6,000 workers to build it. Pa. It is a cow shed. Look at my elegant pavilion. Magnifique. Then meet my 200 best soldiers. Quiver before my 400 finest archers. Try some English beef. Have a French pastry. Watch me hit the bullseye. I could do that blindfold. Brother, we shouldn't argue. You are right, mon ami. Let us embrace greasy French vermin. Fat bellied English pig. Good to see you two getting on so well. And the winner is. The field of the cloth of gold lasted three whole weeks. Every day, Francis threw a feast for Henry, or Henry threw a feast for Francis, or Catherine had the French queen round for a spot of supper. Every day, lances were shattered at the tilt yard and swords had to be hammered back into shape. Henry himself rode six horses in a day. The horses had to retire exhausted, but Henry went on jousting for hours at a time. In the end, 
Both sides claim to have scored vital show-off points. But the winner is... Actually, it's a draw. The two kings parted with words of great sorrow. But it was all a sham. Before long, the English were on the march with... Henry's Barmy Army! Henry spent almost a million pounds on his first French campaign alone. His dream of military glory cost all the money his miserly dad had saved. Trouble often started once the army left England and the food and drink ran out. Greedy soldiers sometimes grabbed double or triple rations. Food wagons mysteriously vanished. Animals died of disease and supplies were cut off by the enemy. When Henry invaded France in 1544, English soldiers ate so much they caused a famine. They stole chickens and ducks, shot hares and drove pigs and sheep into their camp. Naturally, Henry himself never went hungry. Even in a war, he had 200 kitchen staff just to cook his meals. The king's Meals on Wheels included a bakehouse, a wine wagon, a buttery, a poultry wagon, one for confectionery, and a fresh food larder. We're only here for the beer! Henry's soldiers liked beer even more than food. A good supply of beer was essential to get any army on the move. Equally, a beer shortage could bring a whole campaign to a halt. In 1512, Henry sent troops to help the Spanish against the French. The balmy English army was stunned to find the sissy Spanish only drank wine and cider. No beer, no battle, declared the English soldiers. A red-faced Henry had to bring them home. Call a doctor. On second thoughts, Henry's armies often suffered from disease. Diets were hardly healthy and infections spread easily in the camps. Two common complaints were measles and diarrhoea. If the spots don't get you, then the trots probably will. If you actually made it to the battle lines, a wound meant you were in the hands of the camp surgeons. These doctors were handy with sword or saw if you needed an arm or leg chopped off. Surgery was a frightening ordeal. The only anaesthetic was often a bottle of wine or brandy. Say, ah. Bad weather could bring the mightiest of armies to its knees. In 1523, the English were only 50 miles from Paris when the weather turned Arctic. In two days, a hundred men froze to death. Survivors watched their nails drop off with frostbite. Then the weather warmed up and the rain poured down. The invading army struggled home, starving and miserable, in a sea of mud. Thunderstorms! I'll give them thunderstorms! Henry's Leaky Navy The English Navy was founded by Henry VII. Henry VIII set about making it bigger and better, but one of his most famous ships ended up at the bottom of Portsmouth Harbour. Henry's Secret Diary 25th of October, 1509. Today I launched a new warship. By Neptune's beard, she is a sight for sore eyes. She has 120 oars, 207 guns, and can take almost 500 men on board. What's more, she's the first to be fitted with heavy cannon on the broadside. If the French ever dare come near, the Mary Rose will blow them out of the water. 19th of July, 1545. Failure. Disgrace, misery. That leaking hulk, the Mary Rose, has made me look a fool in front of my friends and enemies. Today at Portsmouth, word came that the French ruffians were coming to attack us. I ordered the whole fleet to sail out and meet the enemy. It wasn't long before the cowardly French turned tail and fled. I cheered at the top of my voice. The Mary Rose 
turned back towards the harbour, her gun ports still open. A gust of wind blew her over and she took in water. She capsized and sank like a stone. I'm told almost all the 500 crew drowned. The shame of it. A wager those knavish French are laughing all the way across the channel. Nobbling the nobles. One famous supporter of the war against France was the Duke of Buckingham. Buckingham was the richest and most powerful noble in the land. Gossip said that if Henry died without a son, Buckingham would claim the crown. But Henry suspected everyone of plotting to pinch his crown, so it was only a matter of time before the finger pointed at Buckingham. The Duke was descended from Edward III and had plenty of supporters, but he had powerful enemies too. Among them was old Big Head, Cardinal Wolsey. For the chop. Edward Stafford, Duke of Buckingham. How I'd love to get my hands on that Wolsey, that snake in the grass, that prattling parrot. He went sneaking behind my back, digging up dirt. He bribed my own servants to tell lies about me. Just listen to the foul accusations they made. One, I often cursed Wolsey's name out loud. Lies, lies, may he roast in hell. Two, I was sorry I'd missed my chance to cut off the cardinal's fat head when the king was ill. Three, I had consulted a star-gazing monk who told me that one day I would be king. Four, I was, mark this, plotting to murder the king. I was tried before many of my own relatives in the House of Lords, but they were too busy saving their own scrawny necks to care about mine. Our noble king didn't even come to watch his old friend die. They said he was in bed with a fever. I pray God it was serious. As I lay my head on the block, men and women wept aloud. It took three strokes of the axe to chop off my head. I always was a tough old bird. Signed, Edward Stafford, ex-Duke of Buckingham. When Buckingham got the chop, Henry lost one of his oldest friends. One of the next to go was his second wife. The Tudor Tatler, March the 20th, 1546. Henry ditches the witch. Anne Boleyn is dead. Only four months after the king buried his first wife, he has seen off his second, writes rogue reporter Ralph Quill. The king goes too far says the Tudor Tatler. It's time he started listening to his subjects. Anne Boleyn was not everyone's pin-up queen. To her subjects, she would always be the king's mistress. She was a scheming minx, just one of Catherine's ladies-in-waiting till the king clapped his greedy eyes on her, said a courtier who prefers not to be named. Others say Anne was secretly a witch because she had six fingers on her left hand. Henry claims Anne did cast a spell over me from the moment we met. She was mistress of the black arts of witchcraft. But Henry needed an excuse to get rid of her. Boy trouble! Within three years, Henry was tired of Anne. Everyone hoped she would bring Henry a son and heir. But she gave birth to another girl. Anne lost a second baby, and Henry lost his patience. He suspected Anne of having other boyfriends. From then on, no magic could save her. She was accused of treason, which meant Henry wanted the death penalty. What a blow! Early on the 19th of May, Anne was executed. The executioner cut off her head with one blow. It was so quick, people said Anne's lips were still moving in prayer afterwards. So was this woman really a witch who deserved to die? This paper says not guilty. Any guilt lies with our cruel-hearted king. The Tudor Tatler says the wife swapping must stop here, Henry, or else England might decide to swap its king. Chapter 4 
Artie Henry. By the mid-1530s, fashions were changing. And so was Henry's waistline. It was growing bigger and bigger. Not that anyone dared to say he was fat or anything. Who said fat? No, he was just well-rounded. Even so, he was always the height of fashion. Henry wanted his court to be the envy of Europe. He set out to bring the best musicians, writers and painters to England. He warmed up the cold winter evenings with banquets, dancing and spectacular shows. Top of the bill was an entertainment called A Mask, a sort of pantomime without the jokes. It had songs, music, dancing and breathtaking scenery. Sometimes the mask makers built entire castles or enchanted forests and hid the performers inside. The king and his court played all the parts. They were also the audience, so they were sure to get a warm round of applause at the end. Henry's favourite trick was to disguise himself to fool his courtiers. In fact, he did this so often that his courtiers had to train themselves to look amazed. <laughs> Tis I, your king! Oh, God! Oh, fiend! Your majesty! There's no doubt Henry was a mover and a groover in his day. He sometimes danced till dawn, showing no sign of getting tired. Meanwhile, Henry went on changing partners. No sooner did the cannon fire announce Anne Boleyn's death than Henry galloped off to see his new girlfriend. Her name was Jane Seymour, and, unfortunately for her, she didn't last long either. We interrupt this chapter to bring you tragic news. The Tudor Tatler, October the 25th, 1537. Queen Jane Seymour died shortly before midnight last night, writes rogue reporter Ralph Quill. Poor Jane lasted only 18 months on the throne. King Henry is said to be heartbroken. Only 12 days ago, Henry was the happiest man alive. At last, he had a royal son. It had taken Henry three wives and 30 years of marriage to achieve his dream. Then, last night, it all went wrong. The king looked pale and drawn this morning as he spoke of his grief. Divine Providence he said, has mingled my joy with the bitterness of the death of she who brought me this happiness. No wild child! The Tudor Tatler joins the nation in mourning today. People are calling the Queen the most virtuous lady that ever lived. Plain Jane was sweet and sensible. She rose to fame the usual way, Charming the king behind the queen's back. Anne Boleyn was Catherine's lady-in-waiting. Jane was Anne Boleyn's. Scratch and tiff! Jane was no pin-up queen, and she was no barefaced flirt. Henry once sent her a present of gold sovereigns. Shocked, Jane sent the money right back and begged the king to consider her reputation. Nevertheless, Jane didn't hang back when she saw her chance. The Tatler can reveal that only 24 hours after Anne's head rolled, Jane was secretly engaged to the king. The marriage took place ten days later. Happy family! At home, Jane was palace peacemaker, helping to restore daughter Mary to Dad's favour. Mary had been in disgrace since her mother, Catherine of Aragon, was sent from court. Boy! Oh, joy! Then, on the 12th of October, 1537, Jane gave birth to a healthy baby boy, Edward. <coughs> Court insiders claim the king wept like a child as he held the boy in his arms. Bonfires were lit around the country. 2,000 cannon fired from the Tower of London. But 12 days later, Jane caught a fever and died. Perhaps, after three wives, Henry's had a belly full of married life? The Tatler says, don't count on it. Rumour has it he's already hunting for wife number four. The Dinner Club Sadness may have made Henry eat even more. 
But he wasn't alone in being a porker. Eating was a national hobby for the English nobility. If there'd been a world guzzling championship, the English would have won it hands down and bottoms up. Meals went on for hours, with burps going off like cannon all round the table. Henry's secret diary. It's been a full day. After a spot of tennis this morning, found I'd worked up quite a hunger. Had a thumping great lunch, then went hawking in the forest. By the time we got back, was looking forward mightily to supper. The Emperor's ambassador dined with me, so ordered a goodly spread, and we all got stuck in. We sat down to eat at seven in the evening and rose seven hours later, as well as beef, mutton, pork, rabbit, chicken, pigeon, peacock, and the usual meats, I ordered the cook to make my favourite prawn pasties. We had twenty different kinds, marvellously baked in the shapes of castles, stags, boars and fish. We washed it all down with the finest French and German wines, followed by sweet honey and spiced wines. <coughs> That's better. Settling down for the night now with a hot mug of sugared ale laced with hot milk, eggs and grated biscuit. Mmm. <sighs> <sighs> Wonder what's for breakfast. Whatever Henry did, eating, hunting or gambling, he liked to do it with his pals. Courtiers were there to keep Henry company. If the king wanted to play cards, they wanted to play cards too. If he wanted a race, they ordered their horses to be saddled. Henry's pals were men like himself, big, hearty, sporty types, who were handy in a joust or a battle. But... Henry had an arty, intellectual side to him too. He liked to entertain famous artists and scholars. Give them a Harry. Henry would have enjoyed the Hollywood Oscars. He loved any chance to dress up and show off. So what if he'd held a Tudor version of the Oscars? The megastars of Tudor times were writers, painters and thinkers. Which ones would have made the thank you speeches? The Harry for best poet goes to Thomas Wyatt. Who's he, then? One of Henry's most celebrated courtiers and poets. All courtiers were supposed to write poetry. What's his claim to fame? King of love poetry. If you fancied someone at court, you had to follow the strict rules of courtly love, and writing love poems was not optional. Wyatt had poems coming out of his ears. They were addressed to lots of different women, which didn't mean Wyatt fell in love every Tuesday. He was just doing his job. Worst career move? <laughs> Writing a poem to Anne Boleyn. When Anne was arrested, Wyatt was also made a guest in the Tower of London. The plucky poet kept mum, and soon after, Henry pardoned him. The Harry for best foreign thinker goes to... Erasmus. Uh, who? A great scholar and thinker. Erasmus was a Dutchman who lived in Italy. He was dying to meet the young, brilliant Henry, so he hopped on a boat, came to England, and stayed for five years. Claim to fame? Big name humanist. He studied the classical writings of the ancients, Greek writers like Plato and Homer. Worst prediction? In 1519, Erasmus said he had found a model of Christian society. He was referring to the court of King Henry VIII. The Harry for best comedy goes to... John Haywood. Another great thinker? No, a passable playwright. Early Tudor dramas were either mystery plays based on the Bible or morality plays which warned people to lead a good life. All serious stuff. Only in Henry VIII's reign did the idea of comedy catch on. Haywood was the man who made England laugh. Claim to fame? Wrote plays for nearly 70 years, and he was one of Henry's minstrels. Worst career move? Not changing his name to William Shakespeare. Marlowe, Johnson and Shakespeare were the stars of the great Elizabethan age of drama. Haywood died five years before Shakespeare's first play was performed. The Harry for best foreign flatterer goes to... Hans Holbein the Younger. Hans who? An artist. And not just any artist. Holbein was Henry's court painter. He arrived in 1526 from Switzerland. 
Why Holbein the Younger? Didn't he get old? Yes, but his dad was also a painter called Hans Holbein. The son was known as Holbein the Younger to avoid mix-ups. What's his claim to fame? Painting portraits. Henry banned all religious images, so people were the safest subject to paint. Holbein painted all the rich and famous at Henry's court, leaving us marvellous records of what they looked like. It wasn't done for a king to go and inspect potential brides, so Henry sent Holbein to paint a portrait and bring it back. After Jane Seymour's death, Holbein travelled Europe painting every woman that Henry had heard was rich and good-looking. Worst career move? Painting Anne of Cleves. His picture turned out to be much better looking than she was. The Harry for Best Musician, Composer, Singer, Writer and Actor goes to, by heaven, Henry VIII. Henry who? Ah, <laughs> thou jesteth. Claim to fame? Um, King of England? Besides that stupid. Well, as we know, Henry was a mean musician, a princely poet, no slouch at songwriting. Green Sleeves is his best-known hit, or it would have been if he'd written it. Sadly, experts doubt it was one of Henry's ditties. But here's one he really did write. The Daisy Delectable, The Violet Wan and Blue, Ye are not more variable, I love you and no more. Hmm, pity about Green Sleeves, really. Best career move? Not giving up the day job. The Tudor Tatler, July the 9th, 1540. Henry turns nag out to graze. Fed up, Henry VIII has ended his latest marriage after only six months. The king married 23-year-old Anne of Cleves after seeing her portrait. But now Henry claims the marriage should never have got under starter's orders. The reason? He thinks his bride is as ugly as a horse. Dud match. Chancellor Thomas Cromwell is blamed for not putting the king in the picture. He's in the tower waiting to be executed. Cromwell's envoy, Nicholas Wharton, went on a mission last year to inspect the Duke of Cleves' daughters. He told the Tatler, The daughters were shown to us, but they were so wrapped up we could see neither their figures nor their faces. Hans Holbein, the famous court painter, was the next to pack his easel for Germany. He painted Anne's picture for Henry to see for himself. Henry was so taken with the picture that their marriage was quickly arranged. Sneak preview! The king planned to disguise himself and sneak a look at his new bride before she arrived at court. It would be his New Year surprise for Anne. As it turned out, it was Henry who got the surprise. The king arrived, dressed in a hooded cloak. Master of the horse, Sir Anthony Brown, tells the tattler the full story. Lady Anne was watching the bull-baiting from her window when the king came up the stairs. Henry rushed straight up and planted a kiss on her. The poor girl blushed to her fingertips. She stammered a few words in German, then went back to staring out of the window. She obviously hadn't a clue who her hooded visitor was, and to make matters worse, she couldn't speak a word of English. There was nothing for it but for Henry to beat a red-faced retreat. Henry's opinion of his new bride was summed up in four words. I like her not, he told Cromwell. A roving. Six months later, it's no great surprise that Henry's gone a roving again. This time, it's little Catherine Howard who has caught his eye. As for Anne, she's been shipped out to Richmond and informed the king wants a divorce. But how did she feel about marriage to a man twice her age and about three times her size? Henry's no oil painter himself. The tatler says... You're well out of it, Anne. Better an ugly head than no head at all. Chapter 5. Hooligan Henry. By the 1530s, Henry was getting short of cash. Spend, spend, spend. 
was Henry's motto. His favourite colour was gold. His caps and doublets were gold. His buttons were gold. His sleeves were embroidered with gold. He gambled away hundreds of pounds and spent millions on his wars, so his piggy bank was bound to run dry sooner or later. When Henry looked around for a way to make money, his eye fell on the monasteries. He was now head of the church, and the church was rich. The monasteries were stuffed with silver and gold plate. He just needed an excuse to get his hands on all that loot. Step forward, Thomas Cromwell, tough nut and hard-headed ex-soldier. Henry set him to work in 1535 to report on the size of the church's piggy bank. He really wanted an excuse to close the monasteries down. Monks in Tudor times had a bad reputation, and with some reason. While many of them got on with their studies and prayers, a few behaved in a very unholy manner. Of course, the popular stories were probably exaggerated, but Cromwell and his team didn't mind that. They could exaggerate as well as anyone. Report of the Royal Commission on the State of English Monasteries. To His Majesty King Henry VIII, Supreme Head of the Church of England, we, your loyal commissioners, visited the monasteries and convents throughout your kingdom, and we can't begin to tell Your Majesty of the foul indecency we witnessed, but we'll do our best. These are just a few shocking examples of what we found. At the Winchelcombe Monastery, one monk had been in prison since he was 13 years old. He begged to go back to the outside world to get away from the daily backbiting and brawl. The sub-prioress of Reddingfield Convent has a nasty temper. Half of the nuns walk around with black eyes. A prioress in Lincolnshire keeps her half-starved nuns in the stocks. The abbot of Cern keeps his harem of girlfriends in the cellars. After dinner, the monks usually gamble at dice and cards. As true Christians, we are shocked beyond words by these revelations, but we leave the matter to your majesty, knowing your judgment will be fair and wise. Signed, the Royal Commissioners. Of course, the report was full of whopping lies. For instance, the prior of Folkestone was reported as lazy, in fact, when the visit took place, he was busy repairing his own house at his own expense, rebuilding the bakehouse and the monk's sleeping quarters, idle sponger. Henry wasn't interested in nitpicking details. There was only one message he wanted to hear. The monasteries weren't fit to keep their wealth. It was his duty to take it off their hands, as usual. He dressed up his greed in fine words. I will make... Such a reformation that in the end I shall be eternally remembered in all Christendom. Henry was right. He was certainly remembered. But more as a hooligan than a reformer. In 1536, he put the boot into the monasteries. They were condemned for their manifest sin, vicious, carnal and abominable living which, roughly translated, meant they were a dirty bunch of crooks. Of course, if they coughed up a lot of money, Henry might let them off for a while. Over the next three years, hundreds of monasteries were closed down. The monks were turned out and pensioned off, and they were the lucky ones. Nuns didn't get a penny. Some of the monasteries were given to Henry's pals as manor houses. Others didn't survive hooligan Henry's reformation. The Hooligan's Guide to Reforming a Monastery. One, find beautiful ancient building in peaceful countryside. Two, dig under foundations and put in wooden props. Three, set fire to props and watch walls collapse. Four, strip lead off roof and melt down. Five, invite local hooligans to loot doors, windows and candles. Six, take home monks' books as souvenirs. For those who cannot read, the paper is handy for other things. Henry's Chopping List In 1537, Thomas Cromwell was knocking down monasteries. By 1540, 
it was his turn for the chop. Late in his reign, Henry saw enemies everywhere. He even suspected his friends of being his enemies. So it was no surprise when Cromwell fell out of favour. Someone had to take the blame for Henry's marriage to Anne of Cleves. Naturally, it wasn't Henry's fault. There was one small problem, though. Henry couldn't send Cromwell to the block just for suggesting an ugly bride. Even in Tudor times, that wasn't treason. But Henry could always find a reason for another head to roll. Cromwell wasn't prepared for his sudden change in fortune. He wrote to the king from his cell in the tower. My lord the king, there has been some grave mistake. Why do you keep me locked in the tower? My only desire in life is to serve you faithfully. I beg you to consider how my words have been twisted. They say I spoke warmly of false religious teachings. True, I spoke warmly against them. Second, I'm charged with vowing to fight against your highness. Not so. I vowed to fight against anyone who threatened your highness. Remember how you used to clout me round the head and bellow playful oaths at me? How I long for those happy days again. I know you blame me for your unlucky marriage to Anne of Cleves. True, I thought the match would be a useful one. Those German dukes have big, ugly armies. How was I to know they have big, ugly daughters as well? But since it is Anne's head that offends you, why not cut hers off instead of mine? I beg for mercy on my bended knee. Signed, your humble, loving servant, Thomas Cromwell. P.S. Mercy, mercy. P.P.S. Mercy. Henry's Secret Diary. 25th of July, 1540. Fed up with Cromwell's letters from the tower, begging for mercy, 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 as the knave got three heads. He used to send other men to the block without shedding a tear. Now he gets all weak at the knees when it's his turn. A traitor must die. He has committed foul treason against his king and master. What was it? Norfolk said he'd done again? I've got it written down somewhere. Cromwell's pleas fell on deaf ears. The truth was... Henry was in love again. This time, it was Catherine Howard, whose uncle just happened to be the Duke of Norfolk, Cromwell's worst enemy. This was good news for the ambitious Duke, but bad news for Cromwell. Henry's new love didn't last long, however. Catherine had dark secrets to hide, which was bad news for Uncle Norfolk, and even worse news for Catherine. The Tudor Tatler, February the 13th, 1542. No mercy for Kiss Me Kate. Young Catherine Howard knelt at the block today. Catherine, just 21 years old, had led a busy life. From the age of 15, she'd flirted her way to the top. But in the end, her kiss-and-tell boyfriends caught up with her. Today, the Tatler can reveal the shocking evidence of her scandalous life. Doting Duchess! Catherine's is a rags-to-riches story. Her penniless father trusted her education to her step-gran, Agnes, Duchess of Norfolk. At the Duchess's house, Catherine learnt to attract men like Greenfly to a rose. Here is a list of the ex-Queen's boyfriends. Henry Mannox, Catherine's lute teacher, liked to liven up dull lessons by rewarding his pupil with kisses. <coughs> Flirty Francis Deerham was a gentleman pensioner in the Duchess's household, but he wasn't past fancying young Catherine. The Tatler has evidence that Francis and Catherine even went as far as getting secretly engaged. <coughs> Hot Thomas Culpepper was not only a knight, but a member of the King's Privy Chamber. He introduced Kate to court circles, but Culpepper had to cool things off a while when Kate caught the eye of Henry VIII. <coughs> Henry was still married to Anna Cleves when he saw Catherine, aged just 19. He fell head over heels in love with Catherine. What did it matter that the 49-year-old king was old enough to be her dad? Three weeks after his divorce, Henry married his young bride. He showered her with emeralds, gold, clocks and crosses. 
and for a short while, they were happy. Old flames. But one of Kate's first acts as Queen was to choose a secretary. Who else but Francis Deerham? Kate was no scholar, but the Tudor Tatler has obtained a copy of one letter she wrote in 1541. It was to another of her old sweethearts, Thomas Culpepper. My dearest Tom, I heard that you were sick and never long so much for anything as to see you. It makes my heart die to think I cannot always be in your company. Yours as long as life endures. Catherine. Haunting. Even as a queen, Kate couldn't see why she shouldn't keep a few old flames burning. But someone was bound to talk sooner or later. In the end, it was a chambermaid at old Duchess Agnes's house. When Henry found out, he went out of his mind with rage and self-pity. The Tower! Catherine did her share of weeping too. It would have pitied any man's heart to have looked upon her, claimed Cranmer. But it was too late to save her. One by one, her old boyfriends were arrested. Kate herself was terrified of getting the chop. She was so afraid of disgracing herself that she had the chopping block brought to her cell so she could practice placing her neck on it. When the time came, Kate could hardly talk. Trembling, she confessed she deserved a thousand deaths for offending the king. Then she knelt at the block. So, it's farewell, kiss me, Kate. Yours was a short life, but you made the most of it. We think you were hard done by. After all, you only had four boyfriends. Henry has had five wives and beheaded two of them. Yet no one puts him in the tower. The Tatler says, equal rights for queens. Chapter 6. Has been Henry. By the 1540s, Great Harry had become Old Harry. Henry was in his 50s. In Tudor terms, he was old and wrinkly. Too much wine and red meat had taken their toll. Regular jousting had left him with bumps and bruises all over. To put it mildly, Henry had gone to pot. After his failed marriage to Catherine Howard, the king went back to his old love, food. He ate until he could hardly stagger from the table. Soon, even staggering posed a major problem. One courtier said he had the worst legs in the world. When he married for a sixth time, in 1543, Henry chose Catherine Parr. Catherine was kind and sensible, not a flirty teenager like the last Cathy. She was 31 and no great beauty, but by this stage Henry was more in need of a nurse than someone to set his pulse racing. In his last years, Henry became a cruel, bad-tempered invalid. He mainly kept to the lower floor of his palace. If he did go upstairs, he had to be hauled up in a hoist, like a bag of cement. When his legs were bad, he was carried from room to room in a specially made chair. Naturally, it was no ordinary chair. Besides being enormous, it was finished in gold, velvet and silk. Tudor Treatments Of course, Henry could afford the best doctors in the land. They always had bladder-shaped flasks at the ready. So when the king went to the toilet, everyone crowded round to inspect the results. Tudor doctors knew all about the royal wee. They liked to examine Henry's royal poos, too. Henry kept his doctors busy. In the past, he used to complain of imaginary illnesses. Now he really was ill. He was a doctor's dream. His list of complaints was endless. Headaches, fever, smallpox, malaria. Henry's legs were swollen with ulcers, which later turned to gangrene, so that the whiff of rotting flesh went with Henry everywhere. Dead scared. Throughout his life, Henry was terrified of dying. But in his last years, his fears for his own safety drove him potty. He didn't trust anyone. 
He carried his own personal lock wherever he went. When he went to sleep at night, it was fixed to his bedroom door. Once, at Arlington Castle, Henry got it into his head that assassins were out to get him, so every night he had his door bricked up so that no one could get at him. In the morning, the wall had to be knocked down to let him out. Obviously, he didn't consider that anyone might choose to leave him inside. Henry was scared of all illnesses, too, but his worst dread was a disease called sweating sickness. In one London epidemic, 40,000 people were infected. At the first sign of the sweat, Henry fled in terror to the country. Thousands of Londoners didn't survive the sweating sickness of 1528. Henry did, but his subjects probably wished he hadn't. In his last years, Henry became more and more mean and bloodthirsty. He imagined everyone was plotting against him, and often he sank into black moods, flying into a rage if anyone dared disagree with him. In old age, he was a bloated, bullying monster. By now, the common people hated Henry, and many of them didn't try to hide it. There were hundreds of reports of people bad-mouthing the king. The most dangerous and cruel man in the world, said one subject. A turd for a king, said another. Henry's chopping list, the final years. In his last years, Henry's chopping block was kept busier than ever. In all, Henry had butchered two wives, a dozen or so of his own relatives, and twice as many of his friends. That was just the rich and famous. Hundreds of ordinary citizens were hanged or burnt just for stealing a loaf of bread or not holding Protestant views. Perhaps the nastiest of Henry's crimes was giving the Countess of Salisbury the chop. During her life, Lady Salisbury had been like a mother to Henry. By 1541, she was a doddery old lady of almost 70, but Henry had her arrested and sentenced to death without a trial. Why? Because her son had taken sides with the Pope against the King. Will trouble. Soon it was Henry's turn to meet his maker. Before he died, he made his will. It took care of his own burial and who should succeed him. Amazingly, though he married six wives, Henry left behind only three children. They were Edward, Elizabeth and Mary. Edward was only nine years old, Elizabeth was 14, and Mary, a big girl of 31. Which of them would be chosen to rule the country? Henry had no hesitation. It had to be little Edward. He was young for a king, but he was a boy. Like all Tudors, Henry reckoned girls weren't up to much. They certainly couldn't rule the country. Henry spent his last months in a small room in his palace. Meanwhile, his throne stood empty, but his terrified servants still bowed to it, removed their hats, and even served meals to an empty table. Finally, on the 28th of January, 1547, Henry's great body drew its last breath. The Tudor Tatler. Souvenir issue. January the 31st, 1547. King's death kept a secret. Hang out the flags, sound the trumpets, dance in the streets. The monster monarch Henry VIII is dead at last. The king's close friend, Sir Anthony Denny, told our reporter, the king died days ago. We've been keeping his bloated body on his bed because we didn't know what to do. The problem was the Duke of Norfolk. Henry had him locked up in the tower waiting to be executed. He'd even signed the death warrant. But then the king died first. That put the cat among the falcons, I can tell you, said Denny. What were we supposed to do? Obey a dead body or let Norfolk off? In the end, we decided enough heads had rolled and Norfolk gets out today. Bad fortune. Rumours that the 55-year-old king was dying have been the talk of the nation, but Henry refused to believe his time was up. And none of the king's doctors had the nerve to tell him. The reason? Predicting the king's death is an act of treason. In the end, Henry's pal, Sir Anthony Denny, broke the news. I told the king that 
In man's judgment, he hadn't long to live, Daring Denny told us. He said he would have a sleep and think about it. When he woke up, time was running out. We had to send urgently for Archbishop Cranmer. But Cranmer was too late to hear the King's confession. Henry hadn't the strength to speak, so he grabbed Cranmer's hand to show he trusted in God's mercy. A few hours later, the King was dead. Few of our readers will be sad to see Henry VIII go. Most Londoners were relieved when they heard the news today. Thank God, said street seller Maud Tyler. We're sick of seeing it London Bridge used as Henry's headstand, said John Straw at Cheapside. The Tatler agrees. Today we raise a mug of best ale to the end of cruel King Henry. May England never see as big a tyrant again. Hero or monster? Henry had started out full of promise. Where did he go wrong? Some say he was never the same after he fell off his horse in a joust. Others say his problems started when he lost his mum, aged just 11. Most agree that the rot set in when he got rid of his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. But Henry wouldn't have made excuses for himself. In his mind, he was always right. Henry had a hundred percent faith in his own opinion. And by 16th century standards, he wasn't unusually cruel. Erasmus once called Henry the man most full of heart. And that's why we remember him. Because he was wholehearted in whatever he did whether he was hunting with friends or hunting down his enemies. Last laugh. It wasn't only Henry's kids who survived him. Two other relatives were there to see him buried. Remember ugly wife, Anne of Cleves? She had the last laugh by living on and on after her husband. At Mary's coronation, she shared a coach with Princess Elizabeth. The other survivor was Henry's sixth wife, Catherine Parr although she'd been more of a nursemaid than a wife. Nevertheless, she'd had to watch her tongue. Old Henry was still capable of one last trip round the chopping block. In the end, Henry died first. So the last word goes to Catherine. Catherine Parr's secret diary. <laughs> Goodbye, sweet king. I can't say I'm too sorry you're gone. By the end, you smelt as rotten as mouldy cheese. You can't complain, Henry. I did my best for you. I mopped your fevered brow and bore your evil temper. Saintly Catherine, wise Catherine, they called me. But I was no saint. I was just fond of my own head. Especially as I was saving it for the man I loved. Oh, not you, my dearly departed. There was always someone else right from the start. Did you not know? His name is Thomas Seymour. That's right. You knew his sister, Jane. In truth, you were married to her. Catherine Parr married Thomas Seymour in 1547, a few months after she buried Henry. Thomas was her fourth husband. Mm -hmm.